Um, how many people have a sense of what this debate about immigration reform is right now? How many people have been following the issue and the debate as it's three sort of? And you clearly. You even know the language. Um, so um, I was asked to, to really give an overview, and I don't have very much time. Um, so I'll be as, as economical as I can be. And I was asked to, to begin with a couple of stories. I was asked to begin with a couple of stories to make this present, although uh, the board's heard one. And one is a story, Maggie's story. Maggie, uh, Maggie's family came here uh, 23 years ago from Jordan. Uh, they, uh, the, her parents overstayed their visa because there was a conflict in Jordan and they felt they couldn't go back. And uh, so they, so the parents were here illegally. And her father was suddenly detained, imprisoned in the detention center for four years, and then deported. Um, there was no claim that he was a threat to public safety. Uh, he had no criminal record. At that time, undocumented immigrants were deported and continue to be deported today. And although the Obama administration has set a new priority of deporting people who are a threat to public safety and giving others uh, at least a temporary pass, undocumented immigrants who are not a threat to public safety, who don't represent a threat to national security, many of whom contributing members of their communities continue to be uh, deported today. Um, so there they are. Her mother has four, four kids. They are very poor. Her mother continues to be traumatized. Um, she now works for the Arab American Association of New York and is working on behalf of other young immigrants like herself. Um, then there's the story of David. David is a young, undoc undocumented immigrant, graduated from high school, um, left Brooklyn to go to Staten Island, I don't know why, <laughs> and was in Staten Island in Sandy Hill. So what happened? The deli that he worked at was destroyed, the house he lived in was destroyed, and he was homeless. Because he's undocumented, he's not eligible, he was eligible for no federal benefits. So he couldn't get any rental assistance, and he would be homeless to this day had this extraordinary organization called Project Hospitality not given him some assistance in paying rent. And he, because he's qualified for a, a new status under the, uh, under the Obama administration called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, he is actually able to work legally. Um, but David, because he is undocumented, like so many other undocumented immigrants during Hurricane Sandy, were simply not eligible for federal relief. And without the assistance of extraordinary organizations like Project Hospitality, um, they, they, have, they have been very much on the ground. And I'm going to get something right now. So that's the situation today for many, many undocumented immigrants. And in fact, what most of us know who are paying attention, our immigration system is broken, and here are some of the problems. Um, there aren't enough visas. There aren't enough visas for family members who want to join their, their families uh, in America who have not yet been given the right to, to come to the U.S. There aren't enough visas for skilled and unskilled workers who want to come here to work, who cannot find work, who can't support themselves and their families in their country. So there aren't enough visas, and there are huge visa backlogs for families. So the visa system is broken. Um, the enforcement situation really is comes down to cruel and unusual punishment for undocumented. Um, since 2008, 
two million undocumented immigrants have been deported. This was by President Obama, who wanted to reform immigration and announce it in a comprehensive way, and announced that when he was running um, for president and when he became president in 2008. But it is the law that undocumented immigrants must uh, uh, cannot stay here, and if they're apprehended, they must be deported. Um, these deportations have separated families so that parents are separated from their children. Um, and, and often they're deported to countries where they have no way to, to support themselves. Sometimes countries where there's a very high level of violence. Um, and if they are in danger of deportation, they're not entitled to a fair day in court. So that's the situation for them. They don't have access to lawyers in many instances. And when they're detained, they're detained in prison-like detention centers. That's their situation. And for the 11 million undocumented immigrants who live among us now, they live in fear. They live in the shadows. They're afraid that they or their loved ones will be deported. They are working in exploitative conditions in the underground economy without uh, access, you know, without the right to a living wage, a fair living wage, without any work protection. So that's the situation. 11 million in the shadows. Families continuing to be separated to deportation and, and detention without any kind of due process rights. Um, and families that continue to be separated for years through these bad laws inadequate number of visas to come here legally to work, to join your family, that's the situation. What's widely acknowledged is that there needs to, because this is a comprehensive problem, but there's a lot of dimensions, the fix has to be comprehensive, there's a lot of dimensions. What do we need? We need reform that reduces the backlog so that family members can come here to be united, um, so that skilled and unskilled workers can come here to work, so that they aren't in poverty often in countries where uh, there, there's, you know, legitimate zero violence. And businesses have the workers they need, both skilled workers and unskilled workers. There needs to be enforcement at the border and in the interior and in the workplace. Yes, we acknowledge that, of course. But there needs to be protection of the rights of border communities against the transgression of rights um, um, with, with an enormously um, uh, increased uh, amount of uh, border agents, 700 miles of fence. Um, it's going to be, um, in effect, the most militarized border outside of Korea. Um, so border communities need to be protected. And the, since the worker databases are flawed, the federal databases are flawed, there needs to be protection um, when, when there are checks to make sure that in, in the, in the uh, worker uh, a part of the uh, uh, workplace enforcement, the people need to be protected against exploitation as a result of flawed databases. So that's a fix that needs it. And finally, the 11 million must have a path to citizenship. We cannot allow them to continue to live in the shadows. They are fellow human beings. Just as we were strangers, we as people There's a very robust, extraordinarily complicated, if I didn't like you so much, I would give you detail about all the national and local uh, advocacy organizations that are working with elected officials to fix this broken system. There was an effort in 2007, it collapsed. Business and labor could not come to agreement about a guest work. So the attempt crashed, and conservative uh, uh, lawmakers wouldn't agree to a comprehensive fix that included the legalization of the NIA. It crashed. It was an effort again in 2010. It never even got to the point where a law would be But in 2013, after the 2012 election showed the Republicans that they would never get the Latino vote, they, you know, Obama got 70% of the Latino vote in 2012. That they would never get the Latino vote unless they at least made a gesture in the direction of acknowledging that 
undocumented immigrants who are living in terrible conditions that violate the fundamental moral precepts of our democracy, that unless there is an effort to fix this broken system that Republicans support, they will not get uh, a larger share of the Latino vote in 2016, and they will lose again. So Republicans and, and Democrats, you know, uh, and there was some, a group called the Gang of Eight in the Senate that worked together to draft uh, a bipartisan bill that passed the Senate uh, with 68 votes in June. Hallelujah, we thought. Um, we thought, okay, this really could happen this year until we realized that, and I, I realize this is political, but I think I'm just describing the reality now, um, that a very large majority of the Republican caucus in the House does not buy the argument that, is, that it is in their interest as Republicans to work with Democrats to fix this broken system. Although maybe a, a Republican candidate in 2016 might benefit by getting some Latino votes in the presidential election, they personally are not going to benefit because they are, they live, uh, and there are 200 of them that this description applies to, they live in red state districts that are homogeneous, where most of their voters are opposed to immigration reform and don't want to like immigrants. So, it passed in the Senate, it's moved to the House. Boehner will not allow a vote on the Senate bill. And the real question is, is there even going to be a comparable comprehensive bill that fixes the different dimensions of the problem? Will, it even be will one even be introduced? There's a gang of seven, and it, you know, a, 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 multi, a, a bipartisan gang of seven that's been working for two years and hasn't been able to come to agreement on a lot of the a lot of the issues, they're still struggling to come to agreement. And it may be that no comprehensive bill is going to come to the floor. So what does this mean? It means that there will be a piecemeal effort. There will be piecemeal provisions. And most of them are going to be aimed at enforcement and controlling illegal immigrants, illegals, those horrible people. Make sure that they can't come here anymore um, and not concerned about the 11 million undocumented immigrants because since they came here illegally, they don't have a right to live among us as equals, as citizens participating in our democracy. So it's anybody's guess what's going to happen in the house. Now there's a strategy here, and we heard it from Republican Congressman Peter King, who is in favor, who would actually have voted for the Senate bill. He said, well, you know, these 200 Republicans, they will listen to evangelicals. Um, they will also listen to business leaders. So there is a thought of evangelical leaders across the country reaching out in, with firmness and prayer to Republicans in these districts to make an effort to reach them to change a sense of their own real interests by adding the notion that this is their responsibility as Christians. It's anybody's guess what will happen, but during August, this is going to be one of the efforts. And now I want to talk a bit about us. Who are we? Um, and what is the faith community's role or or the role of faith of the diverse faith communities in this effort to pass what we all call, what, this is our label for it, we must pass just and humane comprehensive immigration reform. Just and humane, because this isn't only about self-interest, this isn't only about pragmatism, this isn't only about growing the economy, and it is about all those things. It is also about who and what we are as a people. A person who really sounds that theme a lot is Obama. If you listen to him, he'll say, we need to do this because it's on our interest. But we also need to do this. And he, he makes this point about a lot of different issues like growing jobs and, and you know dealing with issues of economic inequality. He'll say, this is not in our interest. 
this is inimical to the economic future of our country. But more important, perhaps, it's also what we require to do because it's what's right. And the role of the faith communities is to make that clear and present. We had a meeting, a faith leader meeting in Staten Island with congressional and Forgetting that their parents or grandparents came here as immigrants. They do not identify with immigrants. He is a very serious Catholic. And he said that because he is required, his faith requires him to stand up for the right of undocumented immigrants to come out of the shadows, out of the fear that comes from living in the shadows of our economy of our democracy, of our communities, afraid to call law enforcement when, we're, when they are victims of crime because they're afraid they're going to be deported, those kinds of shadows. He said that his Catholic faith prevents him from taking a pass on this issue, even though it's not in his political interest in his district. In fact, it turns out, 69% of people in his district are in favor of a path to citizenship in favor of it. So he's a little liberated. Uh, but when he said this to us, he did not he did not know those poll results. And he said, I am not free to desist. There was once a book written about the American Jewish Committee in 1957 called Not Free to Desist. He, as a religious Catholic, is not free to desist. And that 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 voice, that moral voice of conscience that for so many Americans is grounded in embracing the sanctity of families and the importance of maintaining the unity of, of, of immigrant families, the critical importance of getting immigrants out of the shadows and living like all other human beings as part of our communities, that, 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 that mission we embraced as an interfaith community of leaders and organizations. And our role was to sound that Mind everyone who we are, what we are, what we must stand for, what we would be sacrificing by acting in self-interest and, and out of out of out of a sense of prejudice and indifference and, and uh, toward the other, that what we would be sacrificing by indulging those darker sides of our nature. And that is our job as the um, and we will be organizing, uh, in, in, there's a national organization called Firm Fair Immigration Reform Movement. This is now the August recess. Nothing's going to happen in the House in August. We don't know if it's going to happen in September. But the, the immigrant advocacy community has called for a month of prayer and action. And our job as the Interfaith Network is to provide opportunities for diverse faith leaders surrounded by the, the diverse immigrants in their congregations, in the communities that they serve, uh, to remind people in Staten Island, people in Long Island, people all over this country who we are and what we must stand for. Um, I, I do want to say something about AJC and how I came to this. Um, and you know, AJC has for decades embraced uh, uh, generous and fair immigration policy. Partly, and I heard this expressed today in our little group, uh, partly because of the Jewish experience. Not only were we strangers, in so many instances we continue to be the stranger, the other. Um, how can we then turn our backs? on others.
treated, relegated to that status, it would be wrong. And so on moral grounds, and also on prudential grounds, when you allow a society to divide itself into the we and the other, and in fact create immigration policy that instantiates that distinction and encourages people to draw that distinction, it's not in our interest either. It's not in our, it's not, it's not allowed by our conscience, and it's not in our interest to live in a society where there's the we and the other. We know what it means to be the other, and it is not in our interest to allow the United States to reflect its darker side. You know, we are both, um, you know, the celebrators of diversity of difference. David Dinkins called New York the gorgeous mosaic. We celebrate difference, but so many of us reject it, repudiate it, loathe it, and we have to strengthen it. It's in the interest of the Jewish community and all of, of the other hyphenated communities to ensure that that element of American society is eclipsed by the angels of American nature. And that's what we're about. Um, very complicated stuff. And as I said, you know, if I didn't like you, I would go into more detail. <laughs> but um, it's very complicated um, and, uh, and not clear where this is going. No one knows what's going to happen. So this reform bill that you're talking about would clearly encourage um, more undocumented people to enter the country. Not true. Um, do you see that? Oh, OK, so why is that not true? Uh, OK, and so I will, I will okay. get into the weeds a little bit. Okay. Um, they're going to build a huge fence. Do you have, they're going to build a huge fence. They're going to build a 700 mile fence. Uh, they're going to double to 400, I've had, I've had thousands, thousands of immigration agents 
all along the border. Um, there's going to be interior enforcement to stop the overstay of visas. And there's going to be enforcement, a enforcement system called E-Verify that it forces employers to check the immigration status of anyone hired. We're worried that there are no safeguards. For example, you know, there's 700 miles of water and it's militarized, completely militarized. Um, and, and so the question is, what's going to happen to the folks who are living in the border communities? You know, what's their lives going to be like? Kind of a nightmare. Um, and uh, so the question is, what are the safeguards? Um, that's what we're worried about. But the whole purpose of this comprehensive approach is if you, if you increase the number of ways for people to come here legally, these are And you have these really stringent enforcement uh, uh, provisions, hopefully with some safeguards, then there won't be the same impetus for people to come illegally because they won't have to. There's going to be a guest worker program for agriculture workers. There's going to be a huge number of new visas for unskilled workers and for the highly skilled workers that the tech industry wants. The tech industry is a major um, uh, proponent of immigration reform. They want those high skilled techies here. And there are going to be special visas for new entrepreneurs to start who want to start a business here. So there's an, so old through visa reform plus enforcement, that's the argument. You won't stop undocumented immigrants unless you get legal ways, more legal ways for people to come, and you seal the border. That, that's the point. Yeah, I interrupted you. No, it's fine. Yes. One of the interesting things to bear in mind with regard to your legitimate concern is, you know, there was a time before the 1980s bill that under the Reagan administration, um, where this wasn't, it was an issue, but not as much of an issue. Part of the reason was that the border was more open, and therefore people who were coming from Mexico to obtain work came at certain times and then returned. Now, they're forced to make a choice, and they have to stay. Part of the reason we have so many undocumented was because that the Reagan reform was not comprehensive. Plus, there'll be aspects of the legislation that'll have cutoffs. There's no magic wand that'll be waived and 11 million people will become citizens. There will be a process. And somebody who comes here and won't be able to provide indication that they've come after the bill is enacted are gonna have a more difficult time. So there are going to be a lot of fine tuning uh, before the bill is produced. Being the pessimist that I am, I don't think it's gonna happen until after the next election. Being the optimist that I am, I completely agree with Diane that the reason that it may happen if it does happen, will be a unified front between the evangelical community and the business community, which is the basis of how Republicans have gotten uh, elected in the post-Eisenhower era. That's been the coalition that's done it for them. And if they're pressuring their representatives, then there is reason for optimism. The reason why the Jewish community has to stand steadfast and what this organization, or the Senate, has the potential to be a leader, is that it's such a defining part of the orthodox theological perspective. If you read the Stone Chumash, you will find a discussion of the Stone Chumash. Certainly not a, uh, you know, a left-wing publication by any means. It says the very definition of the Israelite character versus the Sodomite character is not sexual. The definition is how you treat the poor immigrant, that the Israelite treats the poor immigrant with respect and openness. What did the Sodomites do? It was punishable by death to feed them. So our uh, very thank definition you, uh, has is for that. I, I, I want to say something. You just, <clears throat> it was going to be a punchline, and you just gave me permission to use it. I was a little reluctant. <laughs> so I want to say something about the Jewish community how challenging it's been for us. Because we have participation of Buddhists, Catholics, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, 
but not many. Um, a million kinds of, you know, four kinds of Protestants, Unitarians, Sikhs, they're all on board. Not everybody's very active, but we're having a very hard time making this issue visceral for the Jewish community. There are almost no rabbis and very few Jewish lady involved. It would be so powerful for this organization to come forward and declare that it is on board with just and humane, comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship. Obviously, this is something we're going to have to decide. But I have to say that it would really be noticed. What I really hope is that not only will you do this, but maybe other young leader organizations would be a kind of movement across community lines. But most important to me is this organization standing up and saying, we're required. This is what we're called. This is how we're called. This is what we must. That would be very powerful.